Hello everybody, my name's Kranatoko, and today I want to tell you all you need to know about Apex Legends. Chances are you've clicked on this video because, you know what, it's time. You've heard enough and you want to see what all the fuss is about. Or you're just sick to death of the constant children in Fortnite and the numerous macho macho men in Call of Duty that you'd rather play with an audience that's in between those demographics. What this guide aims to do is take you through all the features and gameplay mechanics of Apex Legends so that you're either better prepared before jumping into the game for the first time or perhaps you're a returning player who needs a refresher or maybe you're just a fan of the game looking for certain information. So while it may be daunting that this video is incredibly long, you don't have to watch all of it if you don't want to, and you are more than welcome to go into the description and click to a specific section that perhaps you need some information on. One final thing before we get into the guide, what you do need to know is that Apex Legends is a game that is ever-changing and adding new things every season. So while all of this information is correct as of Season 10, things like the gameplay meta is subject to change and may be slightly outdated in, say, a year's time. There will be some gameplay mechanics I may not mention, such as some weapon attachments, only because as of Season 10, they're just not in the game. If you'd like to take a look at some of the information I may not have covered in this video, such as attachments not currently in the game, I highly recommend going to the Apex Legends wiki. With all of that out of the way, here is my complete guide to Apex Legends, as of Season 10. So let's start with the simple stuff, just what is Apex Legends? First off, there's the Battle Royale aspect, where you and a bunch of other players are thrown onto a map and have to kill each other. As time moves on, the map gets progressively smaller, usually by some force field that closes in every round, forcing players to compact into one area and eventually continue killing each other. The last man or team alive wins the game. The same is very much true in Apex Legends, except with some twists on the classic formula. For starters, there's no solo mode. Each player is placed with two other players for trio matches or with a partner for duo matches, though sometimes you may end up all by yourself anyway because the match couldn't quite find enough people and you sadly drew the short straw and now you're suddenly a solo going up against 19 other squads of three people. Uh, this can happen in any team game though, it's not just specific to Apex. Once you finally hit the ground, it's time to scavenge for loot. You'll find loot in various places, but mostly you'll either find them in loot bins or lying on the ground. The things you'll find include weapons, ammos, throwables, health items, body shields, attachments for weapons, and knockdown shields. If you're not sure what something does, all you need to do is hover over that item and it'll tell you everything you need to know. However, I will explain each item later in the video. Once you're all geared up, it's time to... kill everybody else and continue to gear up. The idea here is to try and get the best loot possible, which mostly happens in one of two ways. One, RNG is massively in your favour and you just so happen to stumble upon good loot. Two, you kill your enemies and steal their loot. So yes, the main goal is to kill your opponents in order to be the last team standing. And I shouldn't really need to tell you how to kill them, although to put it simply, you just point the gun and shoot while also dodging their attacks. You can also use some of the other loot you may have picked up to help give you an advantage, such as throwing a grenade, arc star, or thermite. One other aspect you'll have is your legend abilities, though again, we'll get to that later in the video. There is also another mode within Apex Legends added in Season 9 called Arenas. You and two other players are thrown into a small arena map against another team of three players. The goal is to kill the opposite team before they kill yours, and the team that wins with at least three rounds and be ahead of the enemy by two points will win the whole match. At the start of each round, each player starts with the same gear. However, you will be given a set amount of materials to spend on whatever you'd like. Whether it be weapons and how upgraded they are, throwables or healing items. Or hey, even your legend abilities. You only have about 30 seconds to choose before a round starts, so choose wisely. Once you reach the third round, your body shield will increase from blue to purple rarity. And if you even somehow manage to get to sudden death, your body shield will reach the maximum red rarity. Scattered around the arena maps will be material containers. Picking these up will increase the materials you have to spend for the next round. 
Getting kills will also increase this amount. Just like the Battle Royale segment, the map will get progressively smaller as time goes on. So, kill the other team before they kill you. Oh yes, I'll be explaining the absolute basics of how Apex Legends works. After all, perhaps you've never played a first person shooter in your life, and Apex certainly has a few unique mechanics. At least they were unique at the time of launch, before many other games followed suit. Movement is simple. Left moves you left, right moves right, forward moves forward, back moves backwards. You have a jump, and you have a crouch. That said, when you come to a hill, using the crouch button while moving down the hill allows you to slide, and depending on your speed and the steepness of the hill will depend on how far you travel. This can sometimes help you escape a fight, so use your crouch often. Shooting is also pretty simple. You use one button to aim your gun, and you use another button to shoot your gun. Although you don't always need to aim, sometimes you'll just hit fire when at real close range to a player, since aiming might hinder your accuracy. One feature that pretty much changed first person shooters for the better is the pinging system. Pressing the ping button once points to a location to travel to, double pressing or spam pressing will ping where the enemy is. You can however hold down the ping button to open a wheel which gives you alternative pings, such as a ping for noticing the enemy has been in a location, or a ping for where you are going to loot, and so on. Pinging an enemy is always recommended as it helps your team locate the enemy a lot easier. Just go easy on the spam pinging. Each one of the legends have three types of abilities. A passive, a tactical, and an ultimate. I'll go more into this in the legend section on what each character can do, but to briefly explain, the passive ability does not have a cooldown and is usually always active in the background. The tactical ability is a small ability which can be used as long as it has a charge. These abilities can generally be used once every minute or so. Your ultimate is a stronger ability than your legend's tactical, but takes a long time to charge compared to the tactical. Upon opening your map, you'll be able to see the world map as well as various other bits of information, such as your daily challenges, items currently in the replicator, and what certain map icons mean. Opening up your inventory, you've got two slots for two weapons only, initially 10 inventory slots, which can be increased with backpacks, a helmet slot, an armor slot, a knockdown shield slot, a backpack slot, and a survival slot. I'll go into these specific items later on in the video. Sound is vitally important for Apex Legends, and paying attention to what you're hearing is key. Footsteps are hugely important to listen out for, because you may be hiding in a building and then all of a sudden hear someone running around that isn't one of your teammates. This obviously means that there is an enemy player nearby. You can also listen for distant gunfire and move in that direction to join a potential fight. Most legends generally have their own unique movement sound as well. For example, you can generally hear when an Octane is moving around or using his steam ability due to his mechanical legs. When a Bangalore is nearby due to her clunky sounding gear. Or perhaps when a Valkyrie is flying about. In time, you'll recognise these sounds, so use this to your advantage. I guess we can't finish off the basic mechanics section without explaining the UI, so let's take a look. In the top left corner you have the minimap, as well as the timer until the ring starts moving, of which that will eventually change to a bar on how close the ring is to being fully closed. You may also notice a little dot, this tells you how far away the ring is from catching up to you. In the bottom left you have yours and your teammates status bars, which shows you various information such as their body armour and health amount. In the bottom centre it shows you what health item you currently have equipped, your tactical ability, your ultimate ability and how close it is to charging, your survival item, and what throwable item you might have equipped. In the bottom right is the two guns you currently have equipped what attachments they have and how much ammo you have. Moving up to the top right, you have how many crafting materials you are holding, how many players and squads are left, and the obituaries. I also do have my performance stats on here, which gives me information on my frame rate and connection. 
Finally, at the very top centre, you have the compass. Though, I've never really encountered any players use this to its fullest by saying something like ENEMY COMING FROM THE SOUTH, etc. Most likely because we have the pinging system instead. Currently, there are 18 different legends in the game. Each character is predetermined, having their own backstories and abilities. The legends have three distinct abilities. A passive, tactical, and ultimate ability. Passives are usually small minor abilities that are always active and can either help buff your character in a small way or can be used in relation to a character's other abilities. Tacticals are abilities that can be activated at the press of a button and usually allows you to help defend yourself in some way, whether it be to attack, fortify yourself or simply escape. These abilities can often be used multiple times within the same minute. Ultimate abilities, however, take longer than your tactical abilities, but are more powerful to use. You either have to wait for them to fully charge, or you can find ultimate accelerants to fill up your charge meter. Respawn are a company that try to cater for all types of players, and so the legends are an incredible diverse cast. You have white legends, black legends, Asian legends, LGBT legends, disabled legends, robotic legends, etc. So, that said, if you're racist or homophobic, please click off this video. We don't want you playing this game. Thank you. Now, with all of that explained for you, here is every legend in the game as of Season 10 and what they can currently do. I say currently as sometimes characters are so weak they need to be completely redone. I'm talking about you, Mirage, you big bamboozler. Bloodhound or Bluthunder is, to put it simply, a hunter. Their passive allows them to see enemy footsteps from up to a minute away, as well as use survey beacons to scan for the next ring. Their tactical gives them the ability to scan for enemies in the area, even behind walls. And their ultimate ability essentially makes them go beast mode, enhancing their senses, their speed, and highlights all enemies for about half a minute. Every kill in this mode also increases the amount of time the ultimate is active for. Gibraltar, or Gibby, as many players like to call him, is probably what you'd define as a tank character. For his passive, whenever he is aiming, he has a gun shield that can protect his upper torso from enemy fire until it breaks. His tactical allows him to throw down a dome shield that protects all players inside it from incoming fire, and also allows Gibraltar to pick up a knockdown player quicker than other characters. And his ultimate allows him to drop a mortar strike wherever he throws the smoke grenade for it. This strike lasts for roughly 6 seconds and will damage and disorient any players it hits. If Gibraltar is considered the main tank of the group, Lifeline would be considered the ultimate healer. Her passive allows her to drop her drone to revive knockdown players, leaving her hands free to keep on fighting while a teammate revives. Her passive also allows her to find extra supplies within blue loot bins. Her tactical allows her to drop her drone again to heal the health of damaged players, and her ultimate ability will drop a care package with various random loot that may be helpful for the team. Usually this care package comes with an upgrade of some kind for one of your team. Pathfinder is adorable. Hi friends. His passive allows him to scan where the next ring is going to be in the next round, which doing so shortens the cooldown of his ultimate ability. His tactical allows him to use a grappling hook, which he can use to yeet himself away from battle. And his ultimate allows him to drop a zip line to either gain the high ground or for a quick escape. Wraith, or as everybody knows her as, Oh look, Salty Wraith has just disconnected after being knocked down. This is the 10th time today. Is a character that can, in a sense, enter alternate dimensions. Her passive lets her hear voices that can warn her of incoming danger. They're aiming right at you. Her tactical lets her phase out of existence for a few seconds, therefore avoiding any incoming damage. And her ultimate allows her to place two portals, which players can use to quickly travel across a small space of the map. Bangalore is the character you pick if you're constantly being hit a lot. Her passive allows her to run at a faster speed when she is being shot at to help her get the hell out of there. 
Her tactical lets her shoot a smoke canister that can create a wall of smoke, making it harder for players to see whoever is inside it. And her ultimate is sort of similar to Gibraltar's, but instead of mortars just damaging players on impact, instead hers will drop missiles that will land in front of where she throws her flare. And then once they've all dropped, they will explode one by one, damaging and disorientating any enemies near them. Caustic, or as many like to call him, Gas Daddy, will choke the living lights out of you if given the chance. His passive is somewhat related to his other abilities, in that he is immune to the effects of any gas he or any other Caustic players drop. His tactical lets him drop a gas canister that will go off if shot at or if any enemy players walk by them, and will damage players for as long as they are near them. And for his ultimate, he can throw a grenade that releases choking gas that similar to the gas trap, will continually deal damage to the player the longer they are in it. Mirage is the class joker. You know, that person who essentially loses everything he holds dear to him, but tries to shrug it off by joking around. You know, that class joker. His passive will make him invisible when he is knocked down and leave a decoy to full enemy players for a few seconds. For his tactical, he can send out a decoy of himself that he can also control if he wishes to in order to trick enemies into thinking that it's him. Finally, his ultimate ability will create multiple other decoys which mimic his movements, therefore screwing around with the enemy player and allowing him to either escape a fight or get the jump on a player. Octane likes to steal all the loot. Why? Because he's fast. Like Usain Bolt fast. For his passive, he will, over time, heal back any damage he has taken for about one health every second. His tactical lets him move 30 to 40% faster, depending on if he has his weapon out or not, though at the expense of 20 hit points of his health. And his ultimate lets him drop a jump pad, which will launch any players into the air while also giving them a double jump. Watson, like Gibraltar and Caustic, is also a tank-like class who uses electricity in her favour. Her passive allows her to gain her ultimate ability instantly when using an ultimate accelerant, as well as carry two accelerants per backpack slot. Her shields also slowly replenish over time. Her tactical allows her to place electric fences that if crossed, stun the player for a second while also damaging them. And her ultimate allows her to drop a pylon that will block any missiles, artillery strikes, or any throwable items that go near it, protecting players in the vicinity. Crypto's abilities rely heavily on his tactical ability, which is his recon drone. He can use this to survey around the map to spot any enemies that are nearby up to a distance of 200 meters. His passive also allows him to check if there are any enemy squads nearby as well as use survey beacons. And his ultimate creates a large EMP bubble around his drone which will damage the shields of any enemy players caught within it. Even Crypto if he's unfortunate enough. Revenant is... angry. Like all the time. But then, can you blame him if you've lived for hundreds of years but can't die? His passive allows him to climb higher and move quicker and quieter while crouching than any other legend. His tactical allows him to shoot a red orb which silences other players and stops them from using any of their abilities for roughly a quarter of a minute. His ultimate ability lets him drop a death totem that allows players to go into shadow mode, and once the shadow player reaches zero health, they are teleported back to the totem with half their health remaining. If you're hungry for cake, Loba has a lot of it. Loba's passive allows her to spot epic or legendary loot through walls and loot bins. Her tactical allows her to throw a bracelet that, when it lands, will teleport her to that location. And for her ultimate, she will drop her staff, which allows her and all players to grab as much ammo as they'd like and two pieces of loot that are within a certain radius. Rampart's quite a heavy hitting legend if you know how to use her properly. Her passive allows her to increase the magazine size and reload speed of LMGs. Her tactical lets her drop shield walls that when you shoot out of them from the blue side will strengthen all of your shots. Finally, her ultimate will let her drop Sheila, a minigun which packs quite a punch, if you can aim your shots properly. Horizon is probably tied as the most kind-hearted legend out of them all, tied with Pathfinder. Her passive lets her land from high heights without being slightly winded unlike other legends. Her tactical lets her create a gravity lift that lets herself and other players fly up in the air. 
and for her ultimate she throws her Newt drone which will create a black hole, sucking players towards it and slowing their movement. Fuse is all about explosions. His passive allows him to stack grenades twice in his inventory, similar to how Watson can stack two ultimate accelerants. And he can also aim throwables further. His tactical sends cluster bombs which briefly stuns and damages the enemy. And his ultimate, aptly named the Motherload, drops mini missiles and creates a ring of fire that damages and reveals enemies that get caught in the fire. Valkyrie would make Woody proud since she reaches for the sky. I'm sorry, that was a bad joke. Her passive straight up allows her to fly into the air at the expense that she can't have her weapon out. She can also scan players she spots while skydiving or using her ultimate and can also use survey beacons. Her tactical lets her send missiles in a rectangular radius which stuns and damages any enemies caught in them. And her ultimate allows her to launch into the air with her teammates attached if needed and escape away from battle. Sia is stylish and suave. His passive allows him to visualize and hear the heartbeats of nearby enemies when aiming down sights. He can also use survey beacons. His tactical sends out a swarm of micro drones that emit a focused, delayed blast, revealing enemies through walls, revealing their health bars and interrupting whatever action they were doing. His ultimate creates a sphere of micro drones that reveals the footsteps of enemies moving quickly or firing their weapons within it. So apart from shooting players, running away and using legend abilities, what sort of things can you expect to encounter when playing the game? Apart from other players, the ring is the other big thing you need to be concerned about. After the timer reaches zero, a red force field will slowly enclose around an area of the map. If you're caught in this force field, you will slowly take damage every second. Rings level 1 and 2 are generally okay and don't deal too much damage. Ring level 3 and above, if caught too far in them, will most likely involve in your death. It'll also make it difficult for your teammate to reach your banner. As previously stated, you can find items to use either on the ground or within loot bins. These bins can contain pretty much any item within the game, with the exception of care package weapons. There are general red bins as well as blue bins. There is no difference to the type of loot these can contain, except the blue bins have an extra compartment with supply items which only Lifeline can open. Backpacks are absolutely essential if you'd like to hoard a bunch of ammo and health items. Each player without a backpack starts off with 10 inventory slots. There are 4 backpack levels from 1 to 4, with each backpack type increasing your loadout by 2 for a maximum of 6 extra slots. So a level 1 backpack gives you 2 extra slots, a level 2 backpack gives you 4 slots, and a level 3 gives you 6 slots. A level 4 backpack however, which is golden in colour, not only gives you 6 extra backpack slots, but when reviving a teammate, it will fill up half their health and half their shields once revived. When one of your team gets knocked down, you can run over to them and revive them. You have to be careful when doing so, however, as this can take about 6 seconds, so if you're reviving out in the open and not behind cover, there's a good chance you may get shot at. If you die, however, your body becomes a death box, leaving your loot out in the open for all to see. Knockdown shields help protect you from damage when you've run out of health and been knocked down. There are four different levels of knockdown shield, each which can protect a set amount of health. They're very situational and are more effective when protecting yourself from enemies at long range since enemies up close can usually just kill you from behind, since the shield only protects your front. While level 1-3 to three knockdown shields can only protect you from taking damage, a level 4 knockdown shield can give you a self revive. The only downside to this is that you're unprotected while reviving yourself. It takes about 10 seconds to revive and it's quite loud so it can alert nearby players that someone is reviving themselves. That said, the level 4 knockdown shield can be effective if you have a level 4 backpack since you'll have half of your health and shields once revived compared to just 20% of your health. When damaged, you're going to want to use health items to heal you of course. Health items include syringes which heals 25 body damage a shield cell which heals 25 shield damage, a med kit which heals all of your body damage, a shield battery which heals all of your shield damage, and a phoenix kit which will heal all of your body and shield damage at the same time. Obviously using a single syringe or shield cell would take less time to use than an entire battery or med kit or phoenix kit. 
However, depending on how much health you've lost, it will take less time to use a med kit, for example, than a bunch of syringes. If you have a level 4 body shield, this will allow you to get double the effectiveness from syringes and shield cells. When you jump into a match, you will automatically have some sort of body shield equipped. For Battle Royale, you'll have a level 1 Evo shield, and for Arenas, you'll start with a level 2 body shield. The difference between the two types of body armor is that Evo shields will increase its level type depending on how much damage you have dealt in a match, whereas body shields do not and remain at its current level no matter the damage you do. Each shield section can absorb 25 damage, so when you reach Evo shield level 5, it can absorb 125 damage total, for example. You'll find Evo shields in Battle Royale, alongside a possible gold level 4 body shield, which allows you to use one healing item at double the efficiency. For example, when wearing a level 4 body shield, one shield cell can heal 50 damage to your shield instead of just 25. Helmets help reduce headshot damage. The higher level the helmet, the more headshot damage it reduces. There is also a gold helmet which, as well as reducing headshot damage, reduces tactical and ultimate recharge time. Currently there is only one utility item in the game, this being the ultimate accelerant. For Watson, this will instantly fill her ultimate ability meter. For every other legend, this will reduce the time it takes before they can get their ultimate. As for survival items, there are two different types, a heat shield and a mobile respawn beacon. A heat shield will allow you to place a sort of bubble that protects you from the ring damage. These don't last forever though, and depletion time depends on the strength of the ring. Mobile respawn beacons allow you to summon a respawn beacon, though it takes time for it to drop from the sky, and a little longer than a regular respawn beacon to revive a player. Speaking of respawn beacons, when a player dies, they're not completely out of the game. A living player can pick up their teammate's banner and take it to a respawn beacon. Once at a beacon, after about 8 seconds, a dropship will arrive and will drop any respawn players you grabbed the banner for back into the fight. There are two different types of care packages, Lifeline's care package and the regular care packages. Lifeline's care packages generally contain health items as well as some sort of upgrade for a player in the team, though they never contain weapons. Regular care packages, however, may contain weapons, though not all the time. Unopened care packages will emit a beam of light into the sky to indicate it is unopened. Blue for lifelines, and gold for regular care packages. Across the map, you'll find zip lines. These allow you to get a height advantage or cross large portions of the map in seconds compared to walking. Jump towers are zip lines that reach up into the air due to the balloons attached to them. These allow you to traverse across the map to either get a height advantage also, or traverse a greater distance for whatever reason, whether to escape a team, or hunt them down, or just to get into the ring. When you either exit the dropship at the start of a match, use a jump tower, or Valkyrie's ultimate ability, you will enter skydive mode. Trying to skydive to a far off certain location can be difficult for new players, but it's really easy once you get the hang of it. On the left side, you can see your diving speed, and on the right side is your altitude. Generally speaking, at least for me personally, you'll want to keep your diving speed between 130 and 140 to allow you to reach your location quicker. So when you dip below this, dive straight down for a second until you reach this number, and then straighten yourself out. The flatter, straighter, and faster you are, the further you'll travel. The lower your altitude, the closer you are to the ground, though I'm sure you'll be keeping an eye on the ground more than your altitude meter. Survey beacons can only be used by recon legends such as Pathfinder, Crypto, Valkyrie, and Seer. Once used, it will reveal the location of the next ring on top of the current ring. This next ring will be highlighted in green. Survey beacons can only be used once per round. In various sections of the map, you'll encounter these bluey green containers, which give you 25 materials. For each loot bin you open, you'll also pick up 5 materials automatically. You can use these at replicators, which allow you to craft various items such as health items, 
ammo, shield upgrades and attachments. Some of these items change every day and every week, so don't expect the same items each day. With the exception of health items and ammo, anything that is craftable in the replicator can only be obtained through the replicator itself, and will not appear in loot bins or in ground loot. Hot zones are areas of the map with a blue circle marker around it that can be spotted at the start of a battle royale game. These are areas of the map with higher quality loot to be found, and the chance to find a fully kitted weapon. When you've knocked down a player, if you feel it's safe enough, you can go up to the down player and perform a finisher on them. These are small animations that can leave you open to be shot, but if you manage to complete the finisher, if your shield was damaged or broken, it will be fully replenished once the other player is dead. Now it's time to get into the nitty gritty details and move on to weapons. Currently there are 7 different types of weapon you can pick up in the game. The game lists them in the menu by weapon type, not necessarily by the type of ammo they hold. There are 6 different types of ammo. Light ammo, heavy ammo, energy ammo, shotgun ammo, sniper ammo, and arrows. It's probably pretty obvious what type of weapons use which type of ammo. Shotgun ammo is for shotgun weapons, sniper ammo is for sniper weapons, and arrows are for a specific crossbow-like weapon, which we'll come to shortly. Light ammo, heavy ammo and energy ammo however can be used by a variety of different weapon types. Some weapons end up in things called care packages. While weapons generally have their own specific ammo type, any weapons that end up as a care package weapon will be replaced by supply drop ammo. This ammo cannot be picked up in the game, so when the weapon runs out of ammo, it's out of ammo for the rest of the game. First off, we have assault rifles, of which there are four of. The Havoc, the Flatline, the Hemlock, and the R301. The Havoc uses energy ammo and can be a little difficult for newcomers to use at first because of its strong recoil, so your shots, if you're not being precise with your aim, can tend to scatter like so. And without the turbocharger attachment, can make the weapon take a second to start shooting. However, once it gets going, it packs a real punch and you can do some real damage. It's an automatic weapon, so you only have to hold down the button to fire. The flatline is also an automatic weapon that uses heavy ammo, and while it too has no stability to it, its spread isn't as intense as the Havoc. It also has high damage output per shot, and has a secondary single fire option in order to try and get good chip damage on a player. The Hemlock is a 3 round burst weapon that also uses heavy ammo. Each pull of the trigger will send 3 bullets towards your enemy that combined can do high damage. It also has a secondary single fire option to do some chip damage if you wish. You can also attach the boosted loader attachment which will reload your weapon faster and add extra bullets if reloaded at the right time. Finally for assault rifles we have the R301, an automatic weapon that uses light ammo. This is probably the most popular and easiest to use of all weapons in the game. Its bullet speed is wicked fast, has high accuracy and is great for close and medium range combat. This weapon can also switch to single fire mode, however the weapon's overall damage output is pretty low compared to other weapons that use light ammo. Moving on to submachine guns, these are weapons slightly smaller looking than assault rifles. We have the Alternator, the Prowler, the R99, and the Vault. The Alternator, which normally uses light ammo but has become a care package weapon as of Season 10, could probably be described as Dummy's first weapon. That is, before it was a care package weapon. While it's a pretty easy automatic weapon to control and has a decent damage output, its bullet firing is a little slower compared to other submachine guns. However, because it's in the care package, it currently uses disruptor rounds, which deals more damage to the player's shields and is the only gun that can do so. Next we have the Prowler, which uses heavy ammo. The Prowler shoots 5 rounds in a small burst with high damage output. The only real downside to the Prowler is it can be a little difficult to control recoil wise. Then we have the R99, an automatic weapon which uses light ammo and is a favourite among many players due to its wicked fast bullet speed, though each bullet does low damage and the gun has high recoil even with a barrel stabiliser. Finally for submachine guns we have the Vault, another automatic weapon which uses energy ammo. The Vault, like the R99, also has a high bullet speed and packs a real punch. The only real downside is its hip firing isn't the best. Next up, light machine guns. 
Despite their name, these guns are anything but light in terms of their appearance, and the weapons themselves are quite chunky looking. There's the Devotion, the L-Star, the Spitfire, and the Rampage. All four of these weapons are automatic. First up, we have the Devotion, which uses energy ammo. This weapon is sort of similar to the Havoc in that it takes a second to charge up, but the bullet speed is very fast when it gets going. The startup time can be improved upon with the turbocharger attachment. The Devotion has strong recoil, but a high magazine clip even without an extended magazine. The L-Star is also an energy weapon, and is a little different to other weapons. While other weapons run out of ammo when the clip runs out, L-Star uses a heat based system. When the weapon gets too hot, only then will the clip be swapped out to help it cool down. So if you burst fire the weapon, you'll never really need to stop and let the weapon cool down. In Season 10, the ability was added to allow it to use extended magazines, which increases the amount of shots you can shoot before it overheats. Then we have the Spitfire, which usually uses heavy ammo, but is a care package weapon as of Season 10. Compared to most weapons, this is probably the noisiest of the lot. The fire rate is also a little slower compared to the L-Star and the Devotion. Finally, the newest gun for Season 10, the Rampage. This gun has a slower rate of fire than the other LMGs, but... Oh boy, does it hurt with each shot, especially since it is easier to control than other weapons. You can increase this rate of fire by using a thermite, which revs the gun. When you also use a thermite to rev up the gun, you can use the weapon to destroy doors, so it can be very effective against those blocking said doors. For marksman weapons, we have the G7 Scout, the Triple Take, the 3030 Repeater, and the Bow Check, which... Funnily enough, each weapon uses a different type of ammo from each other. These are weapons which are best suited for mid-range fighting. The G7 Scout uses light ammo and is a single fire weapon, though despite that it has a high fire rate depending on how fast you can pull the trigger. Next is the Triple Take. Currently this is a care package weapon. However, outside of this, the weapon used to be a sniper rifle, but became a marksman weapon, so it's unlikely when it comes out of the care package it will use sniper ammo, but instead use energy ammo, which it used to use when Apex Legends originally came out. The triple take shoots three projectiles per bullet and has two firing modes, choke enabled and choke disabled. With it enabled, it will compact the projectiles into one singular shot. With it disabled, it will spread the three shots. There is no difference in the damage output per mode, however. Next, we have the 3030 Repeater, a single fire weapon which uses heavy ammo. What's slightly different here is that, unlike other weapons that might have a magazine clip, you're inputting bullets like you might a shotgun, one by one. So, reloading can be a bit slow. The 3030 Repeater has a charge mechanic, where the longer you leave it to charge while aiming between shots, the higher damage it can do against the target. The weapon can use the shutter caps attachment that can spread a single bullet into three projectiles if you wish. Finally for Marksman, we have the Bowcheck, a single fire weapon that uses arrows and is currently the only weapon in the game that does so. It's basically a bow slash crossbow hybrid. I'm sure there's a real name for that kind of bow, but I just don't know what it's called. The weapon has very precise accuracy and high DPS, which can go even higher with the tempo hop up. Arrows that miss the player can be picked back up, and can even be looted from a death box if the player you shot them with dies. A downside is that the drawback of an arrow can take a while, and the weapon isn't that great if you use it at close range compared to other marksman weapons. The weapon has two attachment types to go with it. As previously mentioned, the Deadeye's Tempo, which increases the rate of fire, and the Shatter Caps, which can split an arrow into three projectiles. Next we have Sniper Rifles. As stated, all of these weapons use sniper ammo except the one care package weapon, and each weapon is single fire. We've got the Charge Rifle, the Longbow, the Kraber, and the Sentinel. Starting with the charge rifle, each battery clip can only do 4 shots, but that's because the weapon itself shoots a charged beam at the enemy, and the longer the beam is on the enemy, the more damage it does, with a high burst of damage when the shot ends. A few drawbacks for such a weapon is that it can easily share your location with enemies, being a huge beam of light, and you cannot use extended magazines. Next up we have the Longbow, and while it deals the lowest amount of DPS across all sniper weapons, it has the fastest fire rate across them all. Bullets can also penetrate through enemies and hit other enemies next to them, as well as shoot open doors. Then, we have the Kraber. 
The Kraber is, and probably only ever will, be a care package weapon, because it is a beast of a weapon. It has the highest DPS per bullet in the entire game, and successfully getting a headshot on a person, no matter the helmet they're wearing, will instantly knock them down. The weapon is seriously controversial in the Apex community. However, the weapon is limited to only 12 shots, so make them count. The weapon has a very long reload time and also forces you to stop scoping to rechamber the bullet, so trying to get a second shot off may be difficult. Finally, we have the Sentinel. Similar to the longbow, the bullets can penetrate through enemies, hitting other enemies next to them, as well as shoot open doors, except it has higher bullet damage. This damage can even be increased by 25% when using two shield cells to charge it up, though the energy drains over time and with every shot. However, it does have a low rate of fire due to the bolt mechanism, but can be remedied with the Deadeye's Tempo attachment. Each shotgun weapon uses shotgun ammo, naturally. And there are four weapons in total. The Eva 8, the Mastiff, the Mozambique, and the Peacekeeper. The Eva 8 is an automatic shotgun that's not only great when aiming, but also when hip firing. Compared to other shotguns, it has a high rate of fire that can be made even faster with shotgun bolts. There's not many downsides to the Eva 8 right now, except in order to be top tier with the weapon, having a shotgun bolt is required. Next, we have the Mastiff, a single fire weapon. This tends to be popular with many Apex Pro players due to its very high damage, since one bullet creates six projectiles. The biggest downside though is that if you don't get a decent enough shot, you're not going to do decent damage, so getting real close to the enemy with your shots is usually required. Now, we move on to the Mozambique. Um, what good stuff can I say except it's an automatic weapon? It has good hip fire accuracy. Basically, the Mozambique is an absolute last resort weapon. It has low DPS, low projectile speed, and you need really good accuracy to do decent DPS on a player. Back in the day, the weapon only used to hold three bullets in the chamber, though this has since increased to six. Finally, for shotguns, we have the Peacekeeper. It's a single fire weapon with an incredible DPS. If you can get your shots to land because this weapon has high recoil. You can, however, choose whether to have the choke enabled or disabled. With it enabled, it will compact the projectiles into one singular shot. With it disabled, it will spread the bullets into 11 projectiles. Moving on to pistols, there are only three currently in the game. The RE45, the P2020, and the Wingman. The RE45 is an automatic pistol that uses light ammo. Some people describe it as a mini R99 due to its high-ish fire rate. The weapon is also relatively easy to control, however it has a low DPS rate. Next is the P2020, a single fire weapon that also uses light ammo. Shots are limited to how fast you pull the trigger. Reload time is hardly any time at all and has very low recoil. It's not the greatest weapon to use at close range, and you'll probably be outgunned before you can down a person. Finally, we have the Wingman, a single fire weapon that uses heavy ammo. This is another weapon popular with pro Apex players due to its high bullet damage, if you can get your shots off, since it can be difficult to aim with this at a moving target because of its high recoil. Prior to Season 10, the Wingman and the RE45 used to have a quick draw attachment, which allowed you to switch to them from your second weapon more quickly and also increased hip fire spread. However, as of Season 10, the hop up has been removed, but the effects of the quick draw have been passively added to those weapons anyway. In order to be better with your weapons, you're going to want to find weapon attachments. Firstly, we have scopes, which can range from 1x scopes to 4x 10x scopes. Not every weapon can use each scope. For example, an assault rifle wouldn't be able to use a sniper optic, such as the 4x-8x optic. However, each optic will tell you what type of weapons it can be used for. Then we have barrel stabilizers, which reduces recoil. Simple as that. Next, there's extended magazines. These are based on what ammo type a weapon uses. So you have extended light, heavy, sniper, or energy magazines. You may come across gold magazines, which are level four magazines that will reload your stowed weapon automatically after five seconds. 
very useful for those who quick swap their weapons. There are no magazines for shotgun weapons or the bow check and not every weapon can use extended magazines. We've also got gun stocks. There's two different types. One for assault rifles, light machine guns and submachine guns, and another for marksman rifles and sniper rifles. Stocks reduce aim drift, improve weapon handling and increases reload speed. Next we have shotgun bolts, only usable for shotgun weapons and these increase the rate of fire. Finally we have the hop ups which usually modifies the weapon in some way. Firstly the newest hop up for season 10, the boosted loader. When you're near empty in your magazine, but not at zero, and reload, this increases reload speed and overloads the next magazine with extra rounds. This can only be used on the Hemlock and Wingman. Then there's the Turbocharger, which increases the firing speed for the Devotion and Havoc. Dead Eyes Tempo, which speeds up the fire rate in the Bowcheck and Sentinel. And finally Shatter Caps, which spreads a bullet into numerous projectiles for the Bowcheck and 3030 Repeater. Sometimes in a match you may find a fully kitted weapon. These are gold weapons which come with all possible attachments at the highest level possible. You can swap the optics out for these weapons if you wish, but you cannot detach any other attachments on it. Finally for weapons, we have your own melee ability as well as throwable items. Melee an enemy is usually done as a last resort, however this can sometimes be effective when you're trying to shake off a player right on you. As for throwables, you have a grenade, pretty simple, you aim, throw, and it damages anyone near it when it explodes. The arc star, which is kind of like a sticky grenade. You throw it and it sticks onto whatever it hits, even on a player, and damages anyone near it when it explodes. Finally we have the Thermite Grenade. When thrown, it creates a line of flames that ticks away a player's health for as long as they stand in it. You can't have a battle royale or arena mode without the maps to play them on, and currently as of this video Apex Legends has 3 battle royale maps and 6 arena maps on various rotations. Each battle royale map has different gameplay mechanics exclusive to it, which I'll explain in a moment. Every season, at least one of the battle royale maps will receive an overhaul, where certain areas may be replaced with a brand new point of interest, which helps change the meta and keeps the gameplay feeling fresh. The first battle royale map is called King's Canyon. A lot of the map is very desert-like, what with there being uncovered bones scattered around the map, but every now and then you'll encounter flourishes of life. It was the first map that was released when Apex Legends launched, so for most players, myself included, it feels like home when we play on it. As of Season 8, they've expanded the northern side of the map out, most likely because it just never got as much love as other areas across the map, such as... Skulltown. Rest in peace, Skulltown. Some of King's Canyon's exclusive gameplay features include dropships, which can contain higher tier loot, loot ticks, which when destroyed will drop various pieces of loot, one of which will be the colour of the tick itself, and charge towers, which will completely fill the ultimate meter of any legend standing near them when the towers are used. The second map is named World's Edge. Why? Well, it sits surrounded by lava, just across the way from a volcano that still hasn't stopped exploding to this day. However, while King's Canyon is more dry in colour, World's Edge is the complete opposite, most notably due to its volcanic nature. Some areas of the map are quite city-like, while others are more industrial. Slap bang in the middle of the map, however, is the Harvester, which since Season 4 had been absorbing the power from its core and had destroyed part of the map, though this has since been turned off. As of Season 10, it has caused drastic damage across World's Edge, engulfing certain areas across the map, though allowing for new buildings to go in their place. Exclusive gameplay mechanics for World's Edge include cargo bots, which when shot at drop an orb which can be destroyed for various bits of loot. These can contain vault keys, which can be taken to one of the three vaults around the map, which contain purple and gold rarity items. World's Edge also contains geysers, which similar to jump towers will shoot you up into the air, allowing you to skydive a small distance. The third battle royale map is Olympus, which is, to put it simply, a floating abandoned city. What's different with this map compared to the others is that there's a lot of empty space. That's not in a bad way, as there's lots of buildings to scavenge and hide in, but in between there's a lot of open space which can either spell bad news if you're in the open, or good news because everyone else may be in the open for you to kill. Exclusive features include tridents, which are vehicles that allow you to drive quickly around the map. There's loot marvins, which are like mini slot machines where to get the best loot you have to make it land on the best rarity colour. 
Some Marvins even have gold arms, which can be taken to different Marvins to instantly give you three gold items. Then there's also the Phase Runner, which when entered will let you travel halfway across the map in seconds. Moving on to arenas, there are currently six maps in rotation, though they're vastly smaller than the regular Battle Royale maps. There are three custom maps and three point of interest from Battle Royale maps. The custom maps are Party Crasher, Phase Runner, and Overflow. The three point of interests for Season 10 are Hillside from King's Canyon, Dome from World's Edge, and Oasis from Olympus. However, compared to their Battle Royale counterparts, certain sections of the point of interest maps are out of bounds within arenas. There's not much to the arenas maps. There's a material scattered around, some loot bins with healing items, and a couple of care packages will drop throughout a round. When Apex Legends originally launched, all we really had was training mode and trios mode. Since then, Respawn have added a few more modes to whet your appetite. Firstly, we have trios and duos. This is the basic battle royale experience, except in trios you're in a team of three, and duos you're in a team of two. The aim of the game is to be the last team standing. You can leave at any time, though it's not recommended until your banner runs out of time if you die. As mentioned, Arenas puts you in a team of three and places you up against another team of three in a small arena-like map. The team that wins at least three rounds and is ahead of the enemy team by two points will win the whole match. Currently, if you leave an Arenas match while it is still going, you will incur a small penalty, preventing you from playing any mode. Battle Royale Ranked is exactly like Trios, being the most basic Apex Battle Royale experience. The difference here, however, is that you firstly need to be level 10 to enter. The way it works is that the better you place in a match, the more points you earn in ranked. The more kills or assists you get up to a maximum of 6 kills or assists, the higher your multiplier. So for example, say you reached first place, you would get 100 points. If you managed to get 8 kills in a match, you would only get 6 kills worth of points. Because you reached first place, your kill slash assist multiplier would be 25, so 25 times 6 kills is 150 points. Add your 100 points for winning, you can earn 250 total points in each ranked match. There are 7 different ranks to try and attain. Bronze, Silver, Gold, Platinum, Diamond, Master, and Apex Predator, though Apex Predator is reserved for the best 750 players on a platform. The higher the rank you reach, the better your rewards will be at the end of the season. Depending on your rank will depend on how many points it costs to enter a match. So for example a bronze match is free, since it is the lowest rank, and diamond matches cost 48 RP. However each rank has 4 tiers in them, and if you are at the lowest tier 4 of a rank and haven't earned any points in that tier, you won't be demoted. Once you reach a rank, you remain in that rank until you reach a better one or until a reset occurs, which drops it down by a rank and a half. So if you were in Diamond 4, by the next reset, you'll be dropped down to Gold 2. If you purposely leave a ranked match while alive, for any reason, or before your banner card runs out of time, you will receive a minimum penalty of 10 minutes, preventing you from playing any mode. The more you do this, the higher your penalty. If you're on the opposite end and your teammate purposely leaves, if you're eliminated from the match before you can earn any points, you will not lose any points for entering that match. There is also Arenas Ranked, which works a little differently to Battle Royale Ranked. After you've played your first 10 matches of Ranked Arenas in a season, you will be placed within a rank based on how well you did. You will gain AP for wins and lose AP for losses. You do not earn extra points for killing enemies. There is also no cost for joining a ranked arenas game. And there also is not a split reset halfway through the season. Training mode is something every new player will be required to do before they can play any other mode. This only lasts about 10 minutes and will run you through the basic mechanics of how to play. Once completed, you will have access to the other modes, including the firing range. The firing range is a sandbox that allows you to hone your skills. It contains all weapons, attachments, body shields, gear, etc. that you can find in the main game. It also has targets and dummies you can practice on. You can also bring your teammates into the firing range, and even turn on friendly fire to allow you and your teammates to damage each other. 
Apex Legends has a lot more lore than you might think for a battle royale game. Characters are fully fleshed out with their own personalities and backstories. However, the biggest thing to know is that Apex is set in the same universe as Titanfall and Titanfall 2. So if you've seen things in Apex Legends that you've been thinking to yourself, they ripped off Titanfall! That's because it's all connected anyway. If you don't know what Titanfall is, the first game was a multiplayer only first person shooter released for the Xbox One where you could fight other players using large mechs named Titans. Titanfall 2 released on multiple platforms and carried on with this concept, but also included a single player story. Instead of making a sequel, Respawn set out to make a battle royale game set in the same franchise. And thus, Apex Legends was born. Since Apex Legends released, Respawn have been telling a lot of its story through launch trailers with upcoming seasons. They've also been releasing segments called Stories from the Outlands, which tends to give a large amount of backstory to one of the playable legends. Generally, these sort of videos appear just before a new season drops, but sometimes new videos are dropped with upcoming in-game events. Videos aren't the only way lore is dropped, however. Since Season 5, Respawn have been releasing weekly comics of an overarching story of the season. Unfortunately, once the season ends, these are removed from the game. However, the comics can be found in various places online, such as the Apex Legends wiki. For Season 10, Respawn have decided to not release a comic series, but they've stated more lore is still coming in new ways. At the same time, Respawn can sometimes release canon comics through their Apex Legends Twitter page. Generally, the in-game comics and Twitter comics are drawn by members of the community commissioned by Respawn. Before a new season or a new event drops, you may encounter some strange goings on in-game. Most of the time, these can be very subtle. You might encounter data pads, or something happens for just a few seconds. To tease Season 10, across World's Edge there were mild earthquakes in a couple of areas, teasing the further destruction of the map. You were also able to encounter a small device which, when opened, revealed mini drones taking the shape of a moth, which teased the newest legend, Seer. As you buy cosmetic items, or even earn them through various means in game, you can find some lore text attached to said cosmetic. Some legends have legendary skins which come with canonical lore on what the skin means to them. Most other bits of cosmetic lore can be found attached to the majority of the loading screens you can earn in game. Finally, there are some other bits of merchandise you can buy which can enrich the story for you. Pathfinder's Quest is an art and lore book that follows Pathfinder as he tries to learn about and find his creator. It also helps give extra details to most of the current legends. As well as there being in-game comics, you can even buy official real-world comic books called Apex Legends Overtime, and shows what some of the legends get up to in between matches. You can find links in the description on how to buy these below in the United States and United Kingdom. There's a lot of things to earn in game, all of which are cosmetic and do not affect gameplay. You can go through the entire game not spending a single thing and still earn free items. As you play Apex, you'll earn experience that allows you to level up. Every single level earns you 600 legend tokens, which we'll come to in a second. Between levels 2 and 20, you can earn an Apex pack each level. Between levels 22 and 300, you can earn a pack every 2 levels, and between 305 and 500, you can earn a pack every 5 levels, for a grand total of 199 free Apex packs. Once you reach max level, you'll only receive 600 legend tokens every time you max out your XP bar. There are currently 4 different types of currencies. Legend tokens are used for 3 purposes, to buy the newest legend upon their release in game, to purchase a recolor of a legendary skin you currently own that may appear in the in-game store, and you can use them to reroll daily challenges you don't like the look of, though the more you reroll per day, the higher this starts to cost. Legend tokens are only earned through base game leveling. The premium currency of the game is Apex coins. You can spend real money to obtain coins which can be used to buy a variety of cosmetics, whether it's cosmetics from the store, Apex packs, the battle pass or other legends, though it's recommended to use your legend tokens to buy legends, not Apex coins. The third currency is crafting metals. You can earn these through Apex packs, treasure packs or the battle pass. You can use these to buy specific cosmetic items for an unlocked legend of your choosing. When there are collection events, you can also buy premium skins if you have enough metals. The final currency are heirloom shards, which can be spent on heirlooms, but these are incredibly rare to earn as you'll see later. 
Since Season 1, Apex have released a brand new Battle Pass each season. Every level between 1 to 100 will earn you some sort of reward, whether it's skins, hollow sprays, emotes, gun charms, music packs, loading screens, kill quips, XP boosts, Apex coins, or crafting metals. The Battle Pass comes with 1,200 crafting metals and over 1,000 Apex coins to earn. And each pass costs 950 coins, so if you were willing to save the Apex coins you earn by maxing out your Battle Pass, you would never really have to spend real money again to get the next pass. You can also buy the same pass, but with 25 levels unlocked, for 2,800 Apex coins. Once you reach level 100, you won't earn anything until you reach the max level 110, where you get a recolor of the legendary skin you earned at level 100. Think of it as a bonus for putting in the effort. Even if you choose not to buy the Battle Pass, there are a few free cosmetics you can earn, but they're generally not very interesting and few and far between. To level up your Battle Pass, you'll need to obtain stars, which can be earned by completing daily and weekly challenges. Daily challenges can be swapped out for better ones if you don't like them at the cost of legend tokens, while weekly challenges are specifically locked to your account. These challenges are random and different for everybody. One person might get a challenge to play as Fuse 15 times, while another might get one in the same week to play as Gibraltar 15 times, etc. If it's getting close to the end of the season and you're nowhere near the end of your battle pass, you can pay Apex coins to earn extra levels. Though, be warned, this can be quite costly, as one level costs 150 Apex coins. Apex packs are this game's version of loot boxes. Each pack will give you three different cosmetic items of varying rarities, though you will always get at least one rare quality item or better. When the loot tick explodes, you'll see different lights appear. White is the basic rarity, then blue is rare quality, purple is epic quality, and yellow is legendary quality. With the exception of badges, when you click on a legend or weapon, everything you see that is locked can be earned through Apex packs. You can also earn crafting metals, which, when you have enough, can allow you to unlock something of your choice. If you somehow, and some people have done it, manage to unlock absolutely everything prior to new cosmetics being added, you'll just earn crafting metals. Apex packs may not work like this in your country though, since some countries put a ban on loot boxes, and so you'll just earn crafting metals instead, allowing you to choose what you unlock. Treasure packs were added in Season 5 and are essentially a small incentive to log in and play a few games each day. You can earn one treasure pack a day and can be found randomly when opening loot bins. These rewards are small in comparison, where you can earn battle pass stars, gun charms, crafting metals, and Apex packs. There's only roughly 60 treasure packs that can be earned per season, so you don't have to play every single day. If you feel you won't be able to earn all the treasure packs, if you absolutely feel it necessary, you can spend 25 Apex coins to catch up on the packs you may have missed out on. Each season can come with a host of in-game events. Generally, these can come with a limited time mode or a map update, but usually these events are to sell you limited time skins at the cost of currency. These events tend to only last a few weeks, and even if you choose not to spend any money in the store, you can sometimes earn free skins just by playing and completing separate daily challenges with a reward track. Each legend and weapon comes with their own skins and various other cosmetics. For legends, you have all of their skins, cosmetics for their banner, their emote wheel, and their finishers. For weapons, you have the skins and the gun charms. The skin section has various skins which you can earn through either Apex Packs, Battle Passes, Events and Promotions. Any skins you buy from the store may also appear here, but only after you've bought them. The banner section is where you're going to want to really show off your character and skills. Your banner appears at the start of every match for your team, or other players if you're the champion, to see. These will also appear on the banners found across the map. You have various frames which gives your banner a splash of colour. Poses that, well, pose your character nicely inside the frame. Your badges, which you can earn by performing various tasks or can be earned through special events. Trackers, which shows you things like how much damage you've dealt on the character, amount of kills, how many revives you've done, and many other niche trackers. Your intro equips, which are voice lines generally used to taunt players in the starting lobby if you're the champion player across all players in the lobby. And then there's kill equips, which also taunt players if they've been killed by you. Then you have your emote wheel. Through this you can equip emotes that can be performed for fun in the world, 
hollow sprays which can be thrown onto the ground to let other players know that you were in that location. And you can also attach any of your intro or kill quips to be used at any time throughout a match, whether it's to mock another player or just to have some fun. There's also your list of finishers, which are used to kill a downed enemy and replenish your shields if depleted. Finally, along with weapon skins, there are gun charms, which can be added to a specific weapon to give it that extra flair. There are a ton of gun charms to earn. Some might even say too many. Heirlooms have an odd sort of reputation. There are things absolutely every player wants because they instantly seem to make you look cooler, but they're so difficult to get. Heirlooms are cosmetic melee items that can replace your standard fists in-game. They don't give you any melee advantage despite appearances, they just look cool. The problem is that you can only earn one through two different ways. Through Apex Packs, where you can find heirloom shards to buy an available heirloom for a certain character. The chances of earning these shards, however, is somewhere below a 1% chance. That said, opening 500 total Apex Packs guarantees you heirloom shards to spend on an heirloom of your choice. The other way is through the various collection events, which tend to come with a new heirloom for a specific character. If you have enough money to buy all 24 cosmetics in the event, you will then get the event heirloom as a bonus. Once the event ends, this heirloom will then be available to buy with shards alongside all the other heirlooms in the shop. However, buying all 24 cosmetics can tend to set you back well over $150, or £120. So, is buying 24 cosmetics for the heirloom really worth it? That's your choice to make. Finally, you can find some extra additions in the in-game store, which can come with an exclusive skin for Legend, as well as unlocking the Legend if you haven't already. It also comes with an exclusive weapon skin, a badge, a gun charm or banner frame, and bonus Apex coins. You can only buy these additions using real money. You cannot buy these with any in-game currencies. Two of these additions were released physically, those being the Lifeline and Bloodhound editions. However, the chances of finding these physical copies now and unopened are very rare. Now that you know what to do within the game, here are some general tips on how you can perform well in a match or some fun things in game. Chances are you may know about some of these tips but I see players who are max level and never actually seem to use or know about these. Stowing your weapons will allow you to run slightly faster. Heirlooms don't hinder your speed however. You can tell if you're definitely inside the ring when the ring stops flashing on your minimap. It's very useful if you're trying to hide at the edge of the ring. When you hover over an item and you see a little person symbol, it means that someone in your team needs that item. You can turn on the firing range dummies by emptying your inventory, going to this spot, looking down, and switching to a different legend. The dummies will then move around and start attacking you. You can also go into third person mode, though only in the firing range. This is done by emptying your inventory, going to this spot, looking down, and switching to a different legend. It's just a little fun easter egg. If you're playing on console, you can change your FOV, though changing this can slightly hinder performance. If you're using a PS5 or Xbox Series X, you absolutely should increase your FOV to 110 to allow you to see enemies that would normally be off screen at 90 FOV, though play around with this to suit your playstyle. If you're a brand new player on console, it's generally advised to swap the melee and crouch buttons over, so that crouch is on the right thumbstick and melee is on the rightmost button. Circle for PlayStation, B for Xbox, and A for the Switch. This is because in intense situations, players can sometimes accidentally click the right thumbstick, causing them to punch the air. By swapping these buttons out, you'll instead crouch, which will make you slightly harder to hit when fighting one-on-one -on -one with an enemy. Turn on performance display. This will allow you to view your frame rate and ping, which will let you tell if your internet connection is playing up whilst in a match. Turn auto sprint on. This allows you to run when moving forward instead of needing to press the sprint button each time. There are various colorblind modes within the accessibility menu. Even if you're not colorblind, some players use them based on colors they prefer. So play around with this. Finally, here's one single tip for each legend. While using Bloodhound's ultimate ability, their tactical ability is usable 
every 8 seconds, compared to the usual 25 seconds, so use the tactical at every chance you get. When Gibraltar's gun shield is destroyed, you can see a little meter while aiming which tells you how long until his gun shield replenishes itself. When using your DOC drone to revive a player as lifeline, if the player you're reviving is in danger of being shot at and killed, you can cancel this revive to allow your teammate to defend themselves with their knockdown shield. Pathfinder can use his grapple to immediately attach himself to zip lines and other people. If you need to go outside the ring for whatever reason and have your ultimate as Wraith, when using your ultimate, be sure to leave one portal inside the ring. This is because if both of your portals are in the red field, they will disappear after a few seconds, but if one is left inside the ring, it will stay for the full usual one minute. Bangalore can use her smoke grenade ability to slam open and damage doors. This is very useful if you're trying to create an opening into a building which has a squad in it. You can use Corsic's Gas Trap to block doors and prevent them from being opened. When using Mirage's ultimate ability, pretend to be the decoy. Run in a direction, if possible, that looks like you're about to walk into a wall. This will generally trick the player, since they will be looking for the Mirage that's taken the most obvious path. Once you feel it's safe enough, run a normal path. Using Octane's Stim ability costs 20 health points, however you can never go below 1 HP when using this, so spam this to your advantage if you need an emergency escape. When creating a barrier fence Watson, create two lines of barriers instead of one. Then, when an enemy player tries to pass through them, they will most likely take double the damage. When using Crypto's drone, it will tell you how many squads are in the area on the boards around the map. Pinging these boards with the drone informs your team of how many squads it states are nearby. A lot of players rely on their legend abilities to do well, so if you need to revive a player as Revenant whilst hiding in a building and enemies are nearby, throw your silence in front of doors. Players will tend not to walk through the silence since losing their abilities throws them off. As Loba, when near a loot vault on World's Edge or the loot deck on Elysium and you don't have a key, you can grab a single item locked behind the door, but only as Loba. Doing so will destroy your black market and alert nearby players, so be sure it's the last item you grab. When playing as Rampart and you're fortifying an open space, be sure to amp cover a square area. This means you'll have amped damage from all sides. As Horizon, if your teammate is knocked down and out in the open, throw your gravity lift below them as it will launch them in the air, which makes them more difficult to hit. It will also slightly launch them in the direction they are facing, so it will help them escape enemy players. You can use your ultimate as fuse indoors, so if you need to quickly block an enemy's path, aiming the ultimate in front of your enemies can block their path, allowing you to quickly escape. Just make sure you're not caught in the blast. Be careful when using Valkyrie's ultimate. If you're preparing to launch and then have to cancel out of it for whatever reason, you'll lose 25% of its charge, so you'll have to wait before using it again. And finally, as Seer, if you need to dip out of a fight for a second, using your tactical is a good way to do this, as it may confuse the enemy, but also reveal them for when you jump back in. And we're at the end of the video. This video was a huge project for me, but it was a long time coming. Hopefully I have helped you in some way when it comes to playing Apex Legends. I'd love to make more videos based around the game, so if you like this, please don't forget to like the video and of course subscribe for more upcoming content. I have a lot more planned, not just Apex related. Thank you very much for watching, and a bye bye